lovely chatting. And, and I mean, here's the book for everyone just to make sure everybody can see it. And it's a wonderful book. And, and it's got much more besides. And Ted, it's been lovely chatting. There's so much more stuff, we, but I'm sure. And for 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, I was asking about the things that I'd sort of done in cricket, which I was quite proud of. And of course, the thing I forgot to put in there was the spirit of cricket. Yep. Which, which, which was actually my initiative. And Colin Cowdery helped me a lot with it. And I was a bit miffed when they called it the Colin Cowdery Lecture and not the Ted Dexter Lecture. But that way, he was a lord and I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was having done yeah. that. We had got terrible reports coming in from bad behaviour in schools cricket and club cricket, abusing umpires and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I thought of golf, and there just wasn't anything like that. And golf has rules. <clears throat> Cricket has laws, and it was very interesting. That rule one in golf was headed etiquette. Rule one: this is how you play the game. You play in a sporting way. You do this, you do that, and you do that. And then I looked at cricket, and the only time this was mentioned in sort of fair and unfair play. Was, was these anomalous words, the spirit of the game, the captain is responsible not only for the, to play within the laws, but also within the spirit of the game. But nowhere else was it mentioned. Yeah. And I thought, well, perhaps to bring that up to speed. Yeah. And the MCC committee thought that was a good idea. We put it all together, and then there was a master stroke. We came to it, we all agreed it. We wanted it to be put in laws, but we had a QC in the committee, and he said, Well, uh, the trouble is, you're going to have to have an EGM of the MC to approve this addition to the laws. Oh, oh no. He said, On the other hand, why don't we make it a preamble to the laws? then we don't have to have a meeting. <laughs> and that's, that's where it resides now. So I, I forgot to mention that in the things that I was quite proud yeah. of. That's very clever. That's so interesting. But Ted, thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you for, again, for your generosity towards the MCC Cricket Foundation. And indeed, in, in this instance today, towards the Arundel Foundation too. It's such a, such a lovely thought. And um, there's so much more besides, but it's been great. And um, great to pick up on all sorts of bits and pieces, which will be give much joy to the many, many listeners um, on a sort of cold, February, wet afternoon when things in the world aren't quite so good. So hugely um, grateful to um, you. Folks, right, to sort of tuned in to this Little little show that we've put on. How many? I I I have to bow to the experts on that. Can't, we currently got about two hundred and fifty. Hey. Three hundred. It was three hundred and one at the highest, I think. Yeah, yeah. We, we 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 surpassed three hundred. So, so there we go. Terrific. That's really nice. Have we got any time? Does, do do you want to do any questions, or do you think we've had enough? What do you feel? Um, what's the general feel? I've let the side down twice. I'm I'm up for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So well, I'm going to ask Roger Cooper to open the open the batting on that basis. Roger, can you unmute yourself and ask your question to Ted? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nick. Yeah. Um, Ted, good to see you in full flow. Um, your words and stories coming almost as fast as your runs back in the day. Uh, it's been a really enjoyable hour. Um, my question concerns your last test match in 1968, I think it was, um, against Australia when uh, at the Oval when Dolivera scored 158. 
And then I think a few days after that, the, the touring side for South Africa that winter was picked and Dolly was left out. Um, right. And then there was a big row afterwards. My question is, what, what do you remember about the aftermath of um, that decision? And then Tom Cartwright dropping out and, uh, and Dolly eventually getting picked and then causing the big political um, uh, hoo-ha. Well, I just, I just thought the whole thing was just tragic. Yeah, I could understand the initial um, decision not to pick Dolly. Um, he hadn't, you know, he hadn't been in the running, and they'd obviously made up their minds. And then he made a wonderful innings. And then the whole thing brewed up. But I do remember that two people who I knew well both were two right on different sides of the discussion. One was uh, David Shepherd, the bishop. He was one side of the argument. And the other, oh dear, names, it's terrible. But the famous uh, headmaster of Radley College. Somebody's going to help me. Dennis Silk, was it? Dennis Silk. And they they were sort of completely opposing views. And and I thought this is awful. I know both these blokes. I know they're really two good men. And and they shouldn't be put in this pickle. I tried to get them together, and I don't think it helped very much. But so that's that was my main memory of all that. Fabulous, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Thanks, Ted. I, I'm going to ask Sudhir Yonaka to ask his question, please. Sudhir? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Hello, Ted, thank you very much for your, for your talk. My question is, can you give your recollections of the 1961 Old Trafford test when England were well ahead and then Benno bowled in the second innings? Uh, around the wicket and on the last day and managed to snatch victory. What were your thoughts on that match? Have you read my book on that? No, I haven't. I'm sorry, I, I will do so. Well, there was a, there was a really ghastly subplot mm. that we were in the hands of, of Derek Robbins. Mm. He was chairman of selectors. And he was a very brusque, peppery chap, not the most likable man. Mm. And he also was a drinker. Mm. And on that second day, or second or third day, he did not leave the lunch table till tea time. So he had not seen any of the play mm. between lunch and tea. So when he somewhat inebriated came down and saw the score scoreboard, he was incensed that we'd only scored 60, 70 runs. Mm -hmm. And he stormed into the dressing room and he abused Kenny Barrington. So what the hell do you think you're doing, Barrington? Mucking about, you know, get on with it for Christ's sake. And unfortunately, Peter May was out of the dressing room at the time I was there to tell him to bugger off. Mm. And if you, you have a look, mm. you'll see that we quickly lost wickets. Yeah. Because we, we were burying them. Mm. And it was just, you know, we were getting into an impregnable position and then we'd beat them. Mm. But as it was, we didn't, we, we gave them that half a chance. And, and then they had a wonderful last, wicket stand between uh, Mackenzie and Davidson, I think. Mm. They put on quite a lot of numbers. And suddenly, f from, a, from a, an easy win, we were suddenly left with a situation of having to get whatever it was, 200 in, mm. in two and a half hours. And um, it was a bit of <laughs> bad luck, I suppose, for England. Peter May, I was batting five or six then, and he thought, well, if we're going to win this game, 
we'll get Ted in early with a license to kill. So I got in, I smacked it around the place and put us in a winning position. Uh, then Richie went round the wicket to just stem the runs. Mm. I didn't think he was, didn't, didn't think he had in mind that he was going to bowl us all out. Mm. But it was, it, he, he took a chance, went round the wicket and it turned out to be a brilliant move. Mm. Peter, for some reason, had a sort of half-hearted sweep at about his third ball, got bowled out. Then um, Brown Close hit one down to long leg and got away with it. And then another one was out. Mm. And, uh, you know, from a w great winning position, we lost it. But without, I'm afraid, the, the irate intervention of Robbie, mm. I've, never met, I've never held back saying it. Things like that about you. He's no longer with us. Never speak ill of the dead. But um, he was not everybody's favourite man. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. I'm going to ask Bill Allen, a uh, former chair of the society, who's got a question. Ted, good afternoon. Um, we've talked a lot about your batting, uh, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about your reminiscences of Sussex bowlers. You, you, of course, came up through that era where the, the Hove wicket was particularly good for seamers. And I remember bowls, watching Ian Thompson bowl and then and, and uh, Don Bates and the Bus brothers. And of course, then latterly, Jon Snow. So perhaps you could just remind us of some of those players and also how you bowled yourself. Well, it was by luck, really, that I wound up playing for Sussex. And it couldn't have been a better place to play because on the one hand, it would occasionally be very good for seamers. Not always. Sometimes right. it was a pancake. So sometimes it was nice to bowl on and other times it was damn good, good to bat on. Right. I mean, my bowling had always been a part of my game. And... Um, I mean, when how, how many first-class wickets do you think I took? I really don't know, to be honest. Quite a few, I think. Anybody have a guess? Anybody have a quick guess? Well, someone did put it in the in the chat earlier. So, uh, if if yeah, I th some of us do know. <laughs> they just they just said four hundred and nineteen, Ted. Someone's just put a note up saying four hundred and nineteen. Because normally people say, you, bowler, well, well, how many do you get? 150? Half a bit, half a bit. 200, 300, 400. So I, was no, I, was, I wasn't a pushover. But did you bowl, you bowled big swingers, didn't you, as I remember it? The ball swung a lot from your hand. I always swung the ball. I could swing it both ways. Always swung the ball. I wasn't the most accurate of bowlers. But I was always a bit quicker than I looked. Mm. Um, I was of the generation where you use your body. You know, you, you ran up in days. Um, with the LBW law, the way it was, etc. Um, it was past the era of pitching on and hitting, but you you pitching and so and and it was standard. If if you could be an away swing bowler, you get the ball right down the slot, and I could always swing it. I swing it. Fantastic! Thank you. Thank and you. I managed to get five for eight in my first. Against players, <laughs> five, five for eight. The, the balls in the MCC museum. Right. <laughs> Very good. Fabulous. Is David Allison there? David, you've got a question for Ted. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Ted, it's been a brilliant afternoon. I never had a, an afternoon as as good as this. Thank you. I was just going to ask you, how come you wrote that uh, rules of speedy golf? I think you're persuaded by Gary Player, etc. And were you a speedy player? 
I didn't actually get all of all of that. You're rather going out of shot. Ah, get back. I'm going to see you. So it was about um, the rules of speedy golf you wrote. Oh yes, oh yeah, ten extra rules. They they were going for quite a long while. Yeah. They, I used to run events. Um, my my brother was a good golfer and he died, and I used to run a golf day in memory of my brother. And I produced all my speedy golf missions to, to get us round. Wow. And it was very successful that the very tough city at Sunningdale, he allowed us to play on the two ball course when we were playing in four balls because he knew we got round so quickly. But <laughs> in fact, the RNA have, have finally, they've finally introduced almost all my uh, all my initiative way mm. only three minutes looking for your ball um, one of the best ones which nobody's picked up on is you're not allowed to walk beyond your ball towards the hole for any shot including on the green so you can't have that business of looking at the putt this way and that way on the other side. The whole ethos was you walk up to your ball, you have a look and you hit it, keep walking. But that hasn't been picked up, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that sounds fantastic. Thank, thanks, David. Thanks, Ted. Ted, I've actually got a question myself, if, if, I, could, if I could ask. Uh, and I was very lucky to be uh, coached by Don Smith for five years at Lansing College. Can, wow. can you tell us about Don? And I also understand that it was your recommendation on your recommendation. He, he got the job with uh, Sri Lanka when they started Test Cricket. Well, I always had the great respect for Don. He had a very nice nature, very quite an urbane professional cricketer for those for those days and uh, and and a very good player and I, incidentally I saw he passed away not very long ago were you aware of that yes yes uh, I did see that yeah G January the 10th I think it was 97 he was yeah yes good, good age he went down to lived in Australia did he yeah he was in he was in Adelaide yes yes Yes, I, I never actually saw him since those Sussex days. I can remember one day we were playing a charity game on a Sunday and the pitch was rather close to the members' stand and they were, we were a very popular team at the time. They were all packed in there. And Don kept on clipping it into the stand and suddenly, suddenly stood up and shouted out, Stop this senseless slaughter! <laughs> that was Don Smith. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. Steve Hedges had a question. Steve, are you there? Steve, he can't unmute himself, so I'm going to ask his question uh, for you. He had a question about the Glamorgan captaincy. Were you offered the Glamorgan captaincy in 1958 um, when Wilf Wooler was retiring or had retired? That was uh, his question. I have no recollection of that. The, the only other two counties who I got involved with, because, because I was born in Italy, I didn't have to qualify for any county, so I could go and play for any county. And Warwickshire were after me, and Worcestershire were after me. And Worcestershire were the most persistent. And, um, oh, names again. Their, their chairman was the head of the, the great enterprise who made the undercarriages for aeroplanes. Can anybody remember the name? They still carry the name now, I think. Anyway, he he welcomed me down there to stay the night with him. 
and he said, I'd like to show you around the factory. And we got there and he, and he said, well, you better put on a, a boiler suit. And I, I, I walked around and I said, I'm not sure I'm a boiler sort of person, really. Um, and then I beat him, beat him up on the snooker table in the evening and we didn't talk again. So that, that was the end of that. Then Robin Marler rang up, just said, said, look, if you wanted to play country cricket, come play for Sussex. It was a great tradition of Cambridge men coming down, David Shepherd. Um, and it suited me very, very well because I was just married and I was living in Pimlico, right near Victor Station. Uh, and I could commute very easily down to, down to the cricket, which which I did for a couple of years. It was very it was a very nice way of playing. Fabulous. Well, maybe we've got time for just one more question. Uh, I'm going to ask Rick Rick Piper to go ahead. Uh, <coughs> Ted, it's a it's a massive privilege to speak with you. Uh, the first game I ever saw at home was in 1960. Uh, you were playing, you were captain, you scored 96. But I'd like to ask about your great batting partner of, of Sussex in the 1960s, young Jim Parks. Have you got a story to tell us about young Jim? I know he's a favourite batsman of yours. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Jim was, he, he was the most hand eyeball coordinated person I ever played with. What, whatever it was, one of the things I learned very quickly, I mean, there, there were those, Nancy you know, you've got time to spare, and somebody would bring out some little guy, sort of sabutio, you know, to flick the ball around on a sheet. And whatever you did, you didn't want to play against Jim Parks, because he, he was way ahead before you'd even started. And he was a brilliant fielder, brilliant slip catcher. And then he very sensibly, he thought, well, and he was, you know, I said to himself, well, I can keep wicket. And so he started to keep wicket and he was the England side as wicket keeper which was great, and he was wonderful to bat with because we just understood each other and we ran well between wickets together. I don't think we ever ran each other out. And um, we used to back along at a damn good pace. We, you know, quite often we took the game away from the other side. That's fantastic. Um, we're a bit short of middle order batting at Sussex. At the moment, I don't think, Ted, if you and Jim were available this season, you'd be very welcome to come and play. I'm a bit worried about Jim. It's, it's, Ted, he was ill? Was he ill? Or? I'm afraid I, I can't comment. I've not, um, I know there's several Sussex fans on the call um, who may have uh, better knowledge than me, so I'm afraid I can't comment. Can anybody comment on that? Jim Parks, is he okay? No, okay. Well, maybe maybe all. we can make make some inquiries for you, Ted. Yeah, that'd be nice. Well, uh, it just leaves me to, on behalf of all of us, to say thank you for a fabulous afternoon. Um, I think we can all agree a true legend of the game. Um, how honoured for all of us to to hear you talking about uh, about your career. Um, I think we can all see from the way you talk, you know, why you were so successful, both as a player, but also in everything else you've done for the, for the great game of cricket. Um, thank you so much for talking to us. Please, everyone, remember that Ted has asked, if you want to say thank you, it's the MCC Foundation or the Arundel Foundation, um, because we also need to say thank you to Johnny Barkley for, for holding the show together and for for providing the, uh, the, the conversation. Uh, it's been a fabulous afternoon. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to unmute everyone. It's a bit, you'll hear a bit of a cacophony 
that everyone can say thank you in their own way.